we'll, we'll call the meeting to order. Item on the agenda is public invited to be heard. I do not see anyone, but Erica, do we have anyone that was planning to attend? No, we don't have anybody. Okay. Um, the next item we have is uh, approving the minutes from the February 10th meeting. We have a motion to approve those. Diana, and then we need a second. Uh, and Karen Phillips seconds. All those in favor of approving the minutes from our February 10th meeting, please raise your hand. Okay, opposed and abstentions. Okay, so we have one abstention, Erica. I think that's because I didn't attend. I'm not allowed to, okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right, they are so approved. Um, the next item is review of the 2021 CBBG CAPER annual performance report. Hello, thank you. My, I have a, a two-year-old visitor, so I'm telling my husband to come and grab, please. Um, so I'm Molly O'Donnell. I am going to be, I'm the Div division director for housing and community in investment for the city. I'm going to be giving an update on our CDBG CAPER. So that's our, our um, annual performance report that we submit to HUD each year for our CDBG and home programs. We will be taking this to city council for um, review and consideration on March 29th. And so this also, um, we're in the public review period right now. And March 29th will be the public hearing as well for the consideration of the caper. So um, overall, I just wanna to start by saying in, in past, maybe not 2020, because that was also an interesting year. In prior years, Kathy presented to you the CDBG caper and the inclusionary housing snapshot for the prior year. And I'm going to be splitting that up. It's, it's uh, purely capacity related, but the, the caper is, is complete, but our inclusionary housing snapshot, we're still assessing the data and putting it all together. So I will plan to present that at next month's meeting. So for our CDBG programs, and also we um, wrap in um, report outs on our affordable housing funding program as well, since they're so interrelated and tied together. Um, just to recap, especially because we have some new members here, that each and every project undertaken or completed in 2021 um, helped the city address goal B1.1 of the city council work plan to have a full spectrum of attainable housing for all incomes and stages of life. So these projects keep people in their homes, improves the city's affordable housing stock and prepares residents for home ownership or improves their financial position. It also can make homes accessible for persons with disabilities and leveraged this year, our leverage amount, just pulling up my attachment, was over $40 million because we had a couple of very big ticket items. So that was really, um, really great to see. So in our CDBG program, if you refer to the CAPER performance report attachment that was in your packet, the first page is our CDBG report out. So we assisted 387 total households. 73% of these in our regular CDBG program were low and moderate income. Um, 14 homes received rehabilitation assistance providing improvements to the city's existing housing stock and helping people stay in their homes. Uh, one of those was to, well, I should say 14 is, is much lower than a typical year. Um, this is because we only picked up the CDB, uh, the rehab program partway through 2021 because of COVID restrictions. I hear Encanto, so I'm telling my husband, please come. <laughs> Uh, I think Mabel parent, should be a guest star. If you're a parent, you know, she's right here, <laughs> just playing with pens, drawing on my to-do list. <laughs> you want to say hello? She's your uh, admin assistant. 
Here she is. Say hi. Hi, Mabel. Hi, Mabel. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, such is life. So um, our rehab program only picked up partway through the year. And um, it was partially, you know, it was slow to start partially because people were hesitant to have people have us in their homes. And also because um, it's all right, Molly, just go right on ahead. Yep. You're <laughs> so, fine. Um, okay. <laughs> and also because we, our biggest actual constraint right now is the availability of contractors. We really only have a couple that consistently bid on our rehab projects and with pricing and then the, how busy contractors are, it really limited the program in 2021. So of that 14, one of the homes received uh, assistance to correct code violations, address health and safety issues, or make energy efficiency improvements. Three homes were made accessible for persons with disabilities or to allow seniors to age in place. Eight mobile homes were updated by repairing or replacing roofs or making heating, plumbing, and electrical system repairs. And two households received funding to address emergency situations causing a threat to the health and safety of those residents. Um, overall, we had 202 Longmont residents using our housing counseling services. Um, we had 46 residents that used uh, the R Center rental assistance. This was COVID assistance. We didn't have um, expenditures in our, our security deposit program this year because HSBC did have separate funding to cover that. We did um, provide $150,000 for um, loan principal reduction at the Aspen Meadows Senior Apartments to pay for that rehab project um, that helped offset the costs there. And we did um, provide some funding to complete security measures at the suites um, for the Longmont Housing Authority. Um, so those are exterior improvements. So generally, if you check out your chart, so you've got the CDBG funds on one page, you have the CDBG CV funds there. Um, we did provide 105,000 and change in assistance to the R Center for rental assistance. This was an extension of that COVID um, related rental assistance. The rest of what is slated for that program is in our Fresh Start utility billing assistance program that's run here out of the city. Um, we didn't get our first expenditures in 2021, but we did open the program at that time. And since then, just we've had good progress. We've got $113,000 spent in the first two months of the year. So that is moving along. You'll see that um, performance reflected later. So your next chart is the affordable housing, but I'm going to circle back to that in a moment. Eh, let's, I, I will just do it just to not skip around. So in our affordable housing funding, um, you'll see that we have several projects that were budgeted for, but have not yet um, been expended, but they are in progress. So the city owned rehab, that is um, what we call our Adrian property that is under in bidding right now. So we should have some costs occurring there soon. The East Rogers Road project is um, in design and development review right now. We did spend a portion of our pre-development costs on the Sunset Element project. This is the permanent supportive housing project that's proposed there next to the suites. Um, that project did submit for 9% uh, tax credits on in February 1st of this year. And we do have an interview set up uh, with Chaffa for later in April. So we're hoping for success. Uh, the Cinnamon, Cinnamon Park Senior Housing, that construction is complete. It's leasing up. And we did expend all that the funding budgeted for that. The Mustang land purchase, uh, we did not yet transact this. They just closed on the property recently. So that will be coming forward soon. That's an annual commitment for, for five years. And for Chrisman, uh, that should be completed here by May 1st. That is our projected closing date um, for that project. It's about ready to, to get going on, on construction once we 
get all of our funding finalized. Um, and our, we've got one project with fee offsets here that's listed. So generally, if you go down to your charts, you can see the unspent funds in the um, 2021 available committed expense. So we do have an increase in unexpended funds at the end of the year from 2020, just by uh, just about 75,000, it looks like. Um, really, it was a challenge to spend funding in 2021. I will say that um, we did not meet timeliness this year for the first time in a very, very long time. We are one of many jurisdictions that weren't able to meet timeliness this year. We were not very far off though. The timeliness um, ratio, you have to have less than, you have to have expended more than, um, or not have 1.5 times your, your funding amount in remaining basically by November 2nd. And we were at 1.54, so we were very close. Um, we do project that with the estimate of 2022 funding, we need to spend about $519,000 by October 31st to make timeliness this year. And um, with the several projects that we already have in the works, Chrisman being one, we, we don't expect that to be a problem. So we're shooting to, to get that all squared away. We also are looking at um, how to improve our rehab program, try and do some creative marketing efforts for, um, for contractors, trying to look at how to make our bids more attractive to contractors as well. So uh, in total, 94% of our funds were benefited low and moderate income persons. Um, we were at a very low administration percentage, 6% this year where the maximum is 20%. And every CDBG dollar spent leveraged $82.31 in other public or private funding. So I, uh, the, I'm going to save some of our uh, report outs on our progress on meeting our affordable housing goals um, for the next meeting with the inclusionary housing snapshot. So um, I will open it up for questions or discussion. Anyone have questions for Molly around the um, CDBG performance report? Molly, I had my mine was I was going to ask about what the it, with the rehab program, what we were looking at if we were having trouble getting um, contractors there. It sounds like there's some some plans there to try to bring in some more contractors and or make that more attractive. Um, Mm -hmm. in, uh, go ahead. In the short term, we also, we've got a fair amount of development projects on the horizon, especially with the ARPA funding um, that might be able to use a, a matching source. And so maybe in 2022, if we haven't yet solved our contractor challenges, we would look to, um, to focus some of the funds there. We'll consider that once we look at the budgets uh, and present them to you. Graham. Thanks. The uh, timeliness requirement, is that is that merely allocated funds by the due date or you actually have to spend it? Uh, you have to spend, spend enough funding that you don't have 1.5 times your allocation and remaining allocation over the, the years that you have active funding left in. Um, so it's it's a little bit of a, a complicated calculation. <laughs> And can you, can you just choose, I, I want to connect it back to, to Caitlin's question. Can you just choose to increase uh, what you'll, you'll spend on the, the projects you're trying to attract contractors to, or is that tightly regulated? Uh, no, it's, it's as long as you spend the CDBG funds anywhere, it can be on any piece of what you have planned. So we're basically look at our projects and um, look at the readiness to expend the money and try and do whatever we can on our side to make sure there are no roadblocks to that. And in this case, we did do a good final push, um, but we just came up slightly short because there just wasn't enough out there. Okay, thanks, Molly. And and just to clarify that uh, at a high level, that 1.5, you know, basically in 2021, we had a bunch of money left over from 2020. Right. And so that's why like November, you can't have more than one and a half times because essentially you've already carried forward from the previous year and they don't want you to sort of like stack it. Do that forever. Like that. Um, 
and, and essentially not be using the money when it's allocated to you. Is that, is that roughly? Correct. Okay. Definitely. Uh, Stacy and then Karen Roney. Hi, um, Mary, Molly, just because I'm new, um, I heard you say, and I might've gotten this wrong, but if you could clarify to me and tell me how this works, it'd be great. Um, you said something about for every $1 spent, it, it resulted in $82 back to this. Could you explain that to me? That sounds great. Sure. I mean, that's, that's higher than typical. And that is in this case, because we had a very large project, the Aspen Meadows senior apartments rehabilitation project, that project in itself was a $15 million project that we contributed to. Um, so basically that was all of the rest of that counts as leveraged funds. So if we partially fund a project that funding attracts other funders or other ways to fill the gap, then all of that money altogether results in the leveraging. That's is, is the eight is one to 82, a typical ratio for a year or is that pretty no, high? But if, but we have, that is pretty high. Okay. Um, when we have large development projects coming, which we do anticipate for the next several years, it might be high like that. Um, okay. typically I was looking at 2019, which was a very typical year, you know, before 2020, um, the leverage amount was, so every CDB dollar spent, CDBG dollar spent leveraged 64 cents in other public or private funding. So okay. $82 is quite a, a, quite a big yeah. difference than that. So it really is based on the projects, what kind of big ones are coming through versus more focused ones. Thank you. I appreciate your mm -hmm. explanation. Thanks. Karen. I have a, I have a question. Hold on, um, Robert, hold on just a second, please. Karen. Was, he, Robert can go ahead. Okay. Okay. Uh, it just has to do with, uh, you know, there was surplus money because of the epidemic that was carried over. And I'm wondering what effect the inflation will have that we're experiencing right now on the future. Would you just address that briefly? Sure. So we don't expect it to change our funding amounts, but if our, for example, rehab projects are more expensive per project, then we most likely are able to fund fewer households. We'd have to spend more money for each project if the costs come in really high. So we have to play that delicate balance of um, making sure we have the right number of applicants in the hopper without over committing and leaving them waiting for too long. Karen. Thanks. So I, um, Molly, I don't know whether you mentioned, and if you did, I, I apologize that I missed it, but is that, that, that HUD for the 2021 for the 20, year did give all grantees a pass. Um, I mean, in, in terms of uh, not meeting their timeliness ratio, because obviously um, throughout the whole country, it was very difficult for uh, CDBG grantees to be able to spend um, to that you know, 1.5 or less. So, right. but, but we just got a one year pass. <laughs> so, so we have to ramp up and, you know, and, and I think sometimes what makes this um, extra challenging is that I mean, there have been years and for some of the advisory board members who've been on here for a little while, you might recall that in, in some years we haven't received our CDBG grant funding until like September of that year when we had to meet our timeliness ratio by the end of uh, October 1st of November. So um, so in some cases, sometimes HUD hasn't been our friend in, in terms of, of helping us to be successful in, in making sure we don't exceed our, our timeliness ratio. So um, so just just a just an FYI. And and Graham, if you have any ideas. You're, you're kind of in the business, you know, this, this construction business. Um, if you have any ideas about, you know, how we might be um, creative in recruiting local contractors to help with our rehab projects, um, I just would plant that seed and any, any ideas that come to mind, um, do pass those our way. 
Yeah, I'll, I'll think about that, Karen. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. I have a follow on to that, Graham. Something that we've that we've been thinking about but haven't fully explored yet is if we lumped projects together and do more of a um, a group bid. We have to be careful careful on the back end of making sure that our paperwork is still um, in line with the regs. But would larger projects with more security for the amount of time that a contractor could be busy be attractive? That's, Absolutely. That's, okay. Yep. That's something I'm thinking about putting together a plan for. Um, one sort of follow up on that, you mentioned that if the projects are more expensive, um, is there um, is one of the things we might look at. So I know for some of the um, some of the housing rehab programs, for example, our grants are up to $5,000 or a loan up to 10,000, um, potentially increasing those to essentially allow the same amount of work to be done, but understanding that it's it's more expensive. Um, you know, to, to do that. Um, is that something that's on the table or is that something that's limited? Um, we should explore it. Yeah. We'll just check and see if the regs have any limitations. And if so, if those have been updated at all, um, I doubt it, but, um, we'll look into that and see when we're exploring the other couple questions, how we can make it all fit together. Yeah, I'm assuming it takes, you know, it's like a two, three, five, ten 10 year lag on uh, those getting updated relatively. So uh, yeah, <laughs> typically at least. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions for Molly related to the CDBG funding? Okay, I don't see any. Thanks so much, Molly. You're welcome. And let's see. I, I'm i next as well. <laughs> this is kind of the Molly show. So she's just going to keep on going. Uh -huh. It's the funding application cycle. Yeah. So um, here is what that status is. So um, we did release our funding application in uh, October. We only received one application. It was for $10,000 for an economic development purpose. So that wasn't, we, we started looking at it and doing eligibility and kind of chatting with, it was for e for all um, It's a entrepreneurship for all. Uh, we chatted with them about CDBG eligibility and what really what their needs were to try and um, tailor something that could maybe make more sense. $10,000 is not a lot for the requirements that come with it. Um, so they have submitted that, but with, since now we are so close to, um, well, we're supposed to be close to getting our HUD funding amount, but it, we're at least close to, to preparing our budgets with draft amounts. Um, we normally would try and put out another application funding cycle earlier in the first quarter and then present to you at the April meeting. And um, I have every, every intention of doing that, but with capacity, it's been so tough. Um, so the funding cycle, we do plan on putting out here in the next couple of weeks. And then most likely I'd be bringing those forward to you in, in the May meeting. Um, I don't wanna shorten our application period too much to, to discourage people from applying. And then we thought we'd wrap in that E for all application at the same time. So you can look at the full spectrum. Um, so that is the plan there. It's just, uh, you know, we are doing our best to push through. I do have some assistance in the capacity department coming in. We are about to award a contract for CDBG, CDBG and affordable housing support services um, just to fill in while we try and fill our staffing gaps, our positions that are open, and then help train those once they come on as well. So I should have that extra help here within a matter of a couple of weeks, and this will be their top priority. Just wanted to give you a heads up. Um, Molly, for the that application cycle um, for folks who can apply for, um, you know, things like for, for the various funding, um, 
can you share a little bit about how we make that information available to the community, to folks who might be eligible, um, to projects that might um, benefit from it? Sure. So we do um, the standard newspaper postings, which is a requirement. It's not necessarily the most um, the you know the top way that people find out, but we do outreach to those that we know have applied in the past. Um, we do know a couple of needs already that that we anticipate to apply just from in working with our partners. Um, and then we're I want to look at our engagement efforts actually and see. Um, if there's anything we can um, look at to kind of broaden the base, if there's any new ideas, we've got new people up in the area, like we let's tap into resources to see if there's anything else we can do. Um, so that's my plan is to, to look at that. And also we'll have, a, you know, a CDBG consultants that might have ideas as well that we can bring forward. Great, um, Karen. Yeah, I want. Did we? Did I miss an introduction of Molly? I don't quite. Oh, sorry. <laughs> what's your story? So I just thought maybe you would want to tell us. Well, sure. Molly, Molly introduced herself um, to us at the last meeting, um, but uh, but anyhow, but Molly is uh, Molly took Kathy Fedler's place, so you know Kathy retired the end of January, so. So um, at the February meeting, Molly did hop on and um, and introduce herself, but but it was a quick introduction. So um, no, I was but, at the February meeting, but I don't okay, remember. well that's why there you go. So so yes, yeah, so Molly did. Uh, so Molly took Kathy Fedler's um, place. So she's and, the division director for housing and community. for housing community investment. So I, I apologize, I uh, forgot you were not here with us. So and and Molly has. Um, Molly had been with the city for six years, six seven years. years. So Molly came on board um, during our uh, flood recovery uh, process and, and it helped to manage some of our uh, CDBG disaster recovery projects um, and, and had worked with Kathy for, for that seven year period. So I apologize, Karen, there you go. <laughs> so, but thanks for asking. All right. Any other questions around the affordable or around the CDBG uh, application cycle? Okay. Um, so then we're on the American Rescue Plan Act ARPA investment update. Is this also the Molly Show? I assume. Yes. Yes, it is. <laughs> okay. So we wanted to provide an update through the through the fall. Um, a group of city staff members, well, a large group of city staff members developed focus groups to um, prepare recommendations for city council for how to spend the $12.9 million in American Rescue Plan Act funding that the city has already partially received. Um, and so I headed up the affordable housing focus group. Um, we came up with a plan for how if affordable housing was uh, funded with this large influx of, of uh, you know, special funds, essentially, how our um, projects could be transformative in the community. Um, we have put together a set of goals. There were eight goals in total. Um, the goals just briefly were rental housing development, new home ownership development, LHA rental housing preservation, home ownership preservation, housing stabilization for those exiting homelessness, narrowing the digital divide. This is associated with our affordable housing communities, um, creating crime-free LHA properties and creating sustainable and resilient affordable housing. Um, to support those eight goals, we came up with a list of 18 projects totaling $24 million that um, would be quite transformative. So that was obviously more than, not more than, almost double the total funding amount available. So um, Harold, we proposed those projects to Harold. He 
um, worked to narrow them down and proposed to city council a, um, a list of projects that totaled about 8.9 million of the 12.9 in ARPA funding leveraged with our existing affordable housing funds. So the um, projects that were proposed, I just realized I have to open this second document. I'm sorry, um, Harold is the city manager, correct? Yes, correct. Okay. City manager, Harold Dominguez. So the 8.9 million that was proposed um, included funding allocated to the Sunset Heights project being proposed by Element. This is 55 units of permanent supportive housing over at the Suites campus. Um, the, some funding towards the Chrisman 2 development, which I mentioned in our affordable housing funds discussion is, is ready to close here at May 1st. Um, some seed money to look into an affordable assisted living option. Some basically a seed money again to get a, a development going at the LHA's vacant Hover property at 6, 1764. Um, it is on Hover, 1764 Hover. The, some funding to contribute to uh, the, the Mustang property to look at um, affordable housing there and maybe partnering with a developer that would do attainable as well to have a mixed income neighborhood. Um, this is really to start looking at um, what, what should be done there, what is best for the area, do some engagement, and then have some seed money for starting a development partnership. And, and Molly, not uh, we should talk about Mustang. That was a code word. So it, it really is the Costco. It's part of the Costco, Costco. development that is out east of the of, of the city. So for, for many, many months, uh, the code name was um, Mustang. So, and it just, it just carried forward. Yeah. <laughs> so we've called it several things. Costco is definitely the most identifiable way. Right. So it was about nine acres that um, we purchased as part of that development. Thanks, Karen. Um, we have some funding proposed to put in place bulk agreements with Nextlight at housing authority properties. This is so that uh, utilities are generally already included in the rents there, but not cable service or internet service. So um, if we can work on bulk agreements that can bring the cost down significantly for those residents and also really utilize the city in, in this partnership role to provide its best assets to, to benefit the residents of the housing authority. Um, there is some money allocated towards um, an unhoused option, which is yet to be determined, but this is really targeted towards hard to house individuals. There is money allocated towards the purchase of the, the former Royal Mobile Home Park remnant property from the, I think it was the, the water fund, there was a storm drainage, storm drainage. Thank you fund. Um, this is for the purpose of creating a transit oriented development associated with the first and main transit station and steam area of town. And then finally some support in, in a development and finance position to actually help implement all of this. So that proposal was accepted by city council. And so we are now gearing up to have a very, very busy couple of years with some really transformative projects, primarily development. Um, and we already do have a development specialist um, targeted to join us May 1st to help really be have some expertise in that area. Um, we also, <laughs> we're very busy and capacity growing. We are contracting with the National Development Council, who's going to provide subject matter expertise and um, technical assistance, including access to their, their um, very high quality housing finance training certifications. Um, so that is, we have given them an award and we're just working on the contract. So we're about to have some help there as well to really um, work on some of these larger projects. Um, 
for that development specialist that you said is start uh, targeting May 1st, is that like there's somebody already there and has a start She's date? She's accepted our offer. Mm -hmm. And so, um, and past pre-employment screenings. Awesome. Um, yeah. and, and it's relocating from Montana. Right. So right. it's, that's part of the, the time lag. Yeah. Got it. Um, for the, um, I mean, obviously this is a lot of, of funding that is really going, you know, I think you said it was something like eight to 9 million of the 12 million is going toward affordable housing and housing support. Um, mm -hmm. Pretty significant. I'm curious if you have a sense of how that fits in with, you know, so we have like these regional goals around amount of affordable housing. Longmont as a city is in a unique position, maybe relative, you know, Boulder has like priced out tons of people. So like lots of people have moved to Longmont and now Longmont mm -hmm. is getting more expensive. I'm curious if you know where, what, you know, city of Boulder or the county or others in the regional partnership are doing um, in terms of investing in this type of development and affordable housing, or is it just like, is Longmont leading the pack there? So uh, the city of Boulder is definitely looking at more of a, um, a broader approach where they are, they're doing they're peppering their funds across different aspects more. Um, we are definitely focusing our affordable housing in terms of the percentage of our funding more than Boulder is so far. Um, they're, they're hitting more initiatives and we are um, more focused on a couple of initiatives. Affordable housing is one, there are others as well. Um, data in the city, using data and doing a whole neighborhoods approach. And there's a bunch of initiatives that go along with those. Um, but generally that's what we know about Boulder. Boulder County is in the middle of their community engagement process and the city of Boulder and the city of Longmont are participating in their focus groups on the specifically the affordable housing focus group. Um, so those allocations have not yet been decided but is actively in the process and they plan to have their decisions made by the early May. Thank you. Other questions for Molly on the ARPA investment? You know, I, I think the only thing that I would add is that in, in the whole leverage scheme, so um, we are uh, supplementing the ARPA dollars with um, roughly $3 million, I believe, from our uh, our affordable housing funds from the city, um, so so that the uh, the total investment in the projects that Molly identified is um, is around is basically around eleven million dollars. So we are um, we are basically leveraging those ARPA dollars with our local affordable housing funds too. And I'll add, but yeah, that. but I but I think Longmont really. Um, I think to your question, Caitlin, I think, you know, as, as what we saw in, um, in the whole flood recovery process, um, you know, what we were able to do in terms of using those, um, those disaster dollars that, um, you know, brought on throughout Boulder County, um, I think around, if I recall, a, a thousand new affordable units that we were able to build um, throughout Boulder County. So, um, so you don't get these opportunities very often to have, you know, $12 million, almost $13 million um, in your community. And, uh, and so we just felt, I, you know, that, that we needed to advocate for really making a dent in that affordable housing investment. And, um, and, I, and the city manager and the council agreed with that approach. So we're really fortunate, I think, in that regard. Unless you don't want affordable housing, and then you might think differently. But, mm -hmm. um, but it, it was a, a way to help move us forward for sure. And in that leveraging vein, the the approach really was to use um, public private partnerships to make the money go further. So this is all the the amounts allocated to each are more like seed money, like a local the the local match, if you will. Um, and if you can see how we had one large development project that ended up making our number $84 to $84 to the dollar 
if we're looking at anywhere not even near that where you know, the amount of funding leveraged once we bring in these development partnerships is going to be very large so that was the idea is use this as seed money to bring in all of the other funds too karen i just want was there some slides that we all the conversation you had that i didn't see in the packet or I did realize that the the council communication we didn't insert in the packet, but we can share that link and it's it is on the city website too. There's a lot of public. Yeah, we will follow up with that. Yeah. I was, as we were talking through it, it's like yeah, so that and I yeah. think we do have a uh, we do have the slide uh, the PowerPoint that that Harold presented to the you know to the housing group. So yes, we will we will send you the link so you have that information. Okay, and I I don't know. If this is a question for you, but I was curious on how do people apply in Longmont for affordable housing? Uh, you mean um, residents to yeah. live in affordable housing or for the funding side? No, oh, to live in the affordable housing. So our website does have resources for um, affordable properties that residents can get in touch with to inquire about. And then um, we, through the Longmont Housing Authority, we do um, keep information updated on the website about when wait lists for properties are going to be open. And then we accept applications there as well. I was curious though, like I applied for Boulder a long time ago and we had to go through a big process of, you know, a couple of classes and we had to sit down with the, do you all do that too for everybody that applies in Longmont? We do for, we, we definitely have um, a financial counseling class for those that participate in our down payment assistance program for the, in, there are, there are private and nonprofit providers of affordable housing in the town, in the city as well. And so I'd have to check and see exactly what they do. I was just curious. If it's outside of the city realm. Okay. And, and I would say, you know, that when, um, because you know we're on our second, our second inclusionary housing um, program. So we did have one earlier on, um, you know, that ran from the mid '90s into 2010, and and um, and basically households that purchased affordable homes that were created through that process did have to go through, um, you know, home buyer training and, and and those kind the financial counseling those kinds of things. So it's 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 not atypical that that's a that's a requirement, particularly around um, um, home purchases through the affordable housing program. And am I correct that um, Longmont does a lottery for the Section Eight vouchers um, that are available for city residents? Um, so. I don't know how often that's done. I know there was one recently and it's basically, you know, if anyone wants to live, uh, wants to get one of those vouchers, they enter a lottery and then the numbers are drawn based on the number of vouchers that are available. Um, Correct. So we did open that wait list in January 26th. Um, it had not been done for quite a while, but we're, the, yeah. yeah. But going forward, we plan to do it once every year. Um, so what it was, it was actually 150 wait spot, wait list spots that the lottery was for. So we received 1,100 applicants for 150 wait list slots. Um, the good news is we're already dipping into that wait list to pull some off. And that 150 really is set because that's how many we anticipate we could tap into in that year period. Great. All right, um, any other questions? Okay, thank you, Molly. Thank you um, very much. She, she's Is number seven. Mm -hmm. Conflict of interest policy for CDBP yeah. home program. We're just yeah, one more, going. one more, Molly. <laughs> <laughs> we'll keep going. Okay, so uh, this item, we have drafted up a conflict of interest policy. It was in your packet. This is for the CDBG and home programs. Um, we, the, some guidance started coming out 
amongst our CDBG user groups that, um, that a lot of communities are starting to formalize their conflict of interest requirements um, and include training and certifications for conflict of interest, both on the procurement side, which is, is, is relatively standard, um, although there's there, if certifying it might not be as standard. Um, and then for us also for the staff that work on CDBG programs, our elected officials that make decisions on CDBG and home programs, and then also our subrecipients. Um, so we plan on implementing this policy, um, which would in effect, we would have training sessions that we would do with staff and with subrecipients. Um, we would collect certifications for conflict of interest at time of award of CDBG funds. And then we would just uh, have involvement with our city clerk because the city council does do conflict of interest trainings. And so we would basically document that we've got that going and um, have that updated on a yearly basis. So if there's any questions or comments, this is a draft. We have not yet finalized this policy. So we're looking for your input if you have any. Questions or thoughts from anyone on the board or anyone else? Any. <laughs> so, so Molly, I have a clarification is, um, so I realize this is in draft form. Uh, will this come back to the advisory board for adoption or does it have to be adopted by the council or both? I am not aware that it needs to be adopted. We want the input from the advisory board, but um, like some other policies that we have, it's more that um, we'll finalize it internally and then start implementing internally. But if you have any other, if, if there is a formal adoption process, I couldn't find any examples of that being done for something similar. Graham. I, I admit I haven't read this very closely, but I'm curious if Habitat for Humanity recipients might, might be negatively impacted, you know, because I think in some cases they partially own the property and then I assume HUD or CBG funds might go to those sorts of projects and then they would be living in a project funded by the fund. Does that question make any sense? So, um, so you mean that eventually if they, you mean if they uh, apply for other assistance or other assistance going into the development? Yeah, if uh, Habitat for Humanity, you know, applies for funding for development, mm -hmm. so resident. oftentimes that's associated with the resident who mm -hmm. is who has to perform work on it and in the sort of part mm -hmm. owner in it and thereby, you know, a recipient of those, those funds and then they're living in the home. And so you're funding somebody who's living in the home, which I, I assume is what this document or policy is meant to, to prevent. But we wouldn't want to prevent that, right? No. Correct. We would not yeah. want to prevent that. So right. I'll do a read through and make sure uh, we don't have anything that seems to preclude that. Okay. So just one quick clarification, they're not part owners, they are actually owners of the home. Um, Deanna. Hi, I had a random question about the conflict of interest training, and maybe I'm reading this too broadly, but it says that it's currently required for city elected officials, and it will also be required for various people, including entities that participate or work on the CDBG and home programs. Like, does that include our board, do you think, perhaps, if we're working on these? Okay. Yes. So what I would plan on doing is do a brief training session once a year to to this board, maybe add it to the work plan calendar. Okay, thank you. Um, on that note, uh, Molly, in this draft that we received, I think there's a, when it, say, it says it's for sub grantees or pass through entities, I think there's a typo there that says okay. pass with a T instead of mm. an S. Okay, let me look for that. Um, 
and am I correct? Like the, the gist of this is really to prevent, you know, like, you know, if you work for the city and you were married to someone who was a contractor who was applying for funds, like you making a decision on them getting that contract would potentially be a conflict of interest. Correct. Correct. Similar, like if someone here on the board, you know, we obviously welcome and want like experience around like building affordable housing or things related to the work we do. But if you were applying for, you know, some of that funding, you should not be involved in any deliberations or, you know, recommendations about whether your organization gets that funding. Correct. Other questions or comments on the, the conflict of interest? Okay, I don't see any. So I think, I think Molly, that concludes your, uh, you. your agenda items for this evening. Wonderful. Thanks so much, everyone. Have a nice night. Thank you. All right, uh, next item is the 2023 human services funding process. I am guessing this is an Eliberto show. Correct. Uh, and I apologize. I know that the uh, PDFs are small. Um, and so I am going to share my screen and I'm going to share the uh, the spreadsheets, but be, as I'm doing that, I'm also, because I know we also have new board members who may look at this and may be perplexed uh, by these gigantic uh, spreadsheets. So I will take a few minutes to explain them and then we'll go into the conversation. Does that make, does that, does that sound okay? All right, so I'm going to share my screen. These are the same spreadsheets that you saw. Uh, oh, hold on. Okay, hold on. Can you see? Can you see my spreadsheets? You see spreadsheets? Yes. Okay. Matrix two, concept two is the oh, one you have up. I got to go back to matrix one, concept one. Okay. Uh, beginning. So uh, for Robert and Stacy, this is our uh, allocation matrix spreadsheet. Starting from left to right, we have the agency, the program name, the city of Longmont impact area, and these are impact areas that have been decided upon by the board, um, you know, and um, then what's new uh, for our, our board members who have been around, I've never included a budget size, but this is based on the PowerPoint that I shared in February, and I can always go back and get that as well if, if needed, uh, but that is what that is based on. Uh, then the next column says priority area. That was just uh, to determine that the programs that was being um, proposed is in the priority area. If it's a no, then it is automatically disqualified, which is why these are all yeses. Um, and Karen and I read the proposals and we make that judgment. Um, now, what I did in the request only of this first matrix is, this is matrix is, and for some reason I'm still in matrix two. All right, sorry, my bad. Um, I don't know why I went back to matrix two. Um, and this one doesn't have the budgets yet, sorry. Um, but it has what they received in 2021. Um, it has what they, if they had requested the ceiling, what is the ceiling based on that priority area? And then there is a, the column that says board average. All of the board members um, are given the opportunity to score all of the proposed projects. And at some point I will go over the um, evaluation, uh, we are working on changing to found it. Uh, and so that's gonna, we're gonna have to work on that. Uh, and then, and the board has their own 
questions that they answer on the evaluation, which you will get trained on. Then the staff, which, yeah, the staff has our own uh, evaluation uh, sheet as well, and we score it. And then we take the average of staff, average of board, and you get a total. And that total is put up against a formula. I'm gonna show the formula real quick. I'm not gonna spend a lot of time, but just so you see it. Uh, if you, this is the, the ranges on the top, on the right, this time going right to left. Um, and these are the individuals or the staff ranges and the board ranges, and then the percentage of what you can get. So just so you know, this ranges and these are actual scores from the 2022 fun round that we just um, completed in 2021. So nothing changed there. I just copied that over from what it was. Uh, so those are exact scores that the board scored and the staff scored and what they ended up. The only thing that's different is I went back and I applied and I, and I did this because there, the assumption is that if they know that we have ceilings, everybody's applying for the ceiling, right? That's, that's the assumption that I went by. Is that the truth? Is that what's going to happen? Well, that is to be determined. Um, so, but I went by that if they know that we have ceilings, that's what they're going to apply for. Um, and so you see that this is what the score said they would get, depending on their score, either 100% or 90%. And we scroll down and it goes that way. Uh, a way forward did not get, did not score high enough to be funded. So they still did not get any funding. Um, and then, like I said, I just went by uh, what they scored and what the ceilings were and what would their percentage be based on their score. And I think the important piece, senior housing options, again, did not score high enough to be funded. We would have spent $2.8 million using this method if everybody applied for the ceilings. Uh, as, a, as a reminder, we had $1.2 million. So we are over by about $1.6 million. Uh, if, we, if, if we assume that everybody applies at the ceilings, if we maintain these ceilings that are in this little uh, text box, um, and if we kept the same allocation formula. I just wanted to show you, because that was one of the concepts that Karen and I shared. So I'm not sure there's any questions or we want to move on to the next concept. I do not see any questions, but if folks have them, please feel free to. Yeah, I think I would move on to the next concept. All right. It, concept. Just a reminder for the board, you know, we did talk about this process in February and and the board says, you know, bring back some real live examples of how that would work based on what we just completed. So that's the real world example. <laughs> so, so go ahead, Eliberto. So concept two, remember that was based on budget size, not priority area, right? That was a difference in concept two. We said, well, we're not gonna, we're not going to change, um, concept, we're going we're gonna to look at budget to determine how, how much someone can, can receive or can be allocated. Uh, and so it was, if you had a million dollars or more, you were up to 100,000 and it just went down from that. What I found interesting is, I mean, I saw these with you all when we all read them, but I've never compiled the data, is how many of our nonprofits have over million dollar agency budgets? I was pretty am amazed at that. Uh, yes, we've had conversations about supporting smaller nonprofits in this group, but the reality is that most of the applications that we get, uh, a vast majority of them are agencies that have budgets over a million dollars and some are pretty, you know, pretty big budgets. Um, and so with this concept, again, not touching percentages, not touching scores, 
just changing ceilings and, and assuming that everybody's applying for the ceiling if they know they have it, um, then we spend $3.4 million, uh, which is 2.1 million over what we had. Okay, that is, is concept two. This is a little trickier. Uh, this is, uh, this, I played around with this one. This one is, and I'm gonna read this just to make sure, is that we have ceilings, but they're also going to be impacted by budgets. So this is tricky um, because we use both. Uh, and it was hard to explain to Karen, so I'm not sure if I can still explain it to you all. Um, I think I took, let me see, uh, the ceiling, the foundational ceilings will be based. So the first ceiling is priority. However, seedings will also be affected by budget size. So in other words, if you are in, let's take, let's take, um, let's take Mother House, who has a smaller budget than the rest of the housing stability, right? So other agencies have a million or more. Mother House has five hundred thousand to a million dollars. So their ceiling now is impacted by their budget and they get 75% of that ceiling because of their size of their budget. So Mother House's new ceiling would be 75,000. So depending on your budget, your base ceiling is a priority ceiling, but your budget can impact that. Does that make sense? think so. Okay. So all said and done, um, we end up spending 2.5 million on this route, uh, which is again about 1.3 million over what we had available to us. And, and Eliberto, on, on all three of these that you've presented so far, this is assuming that we use the same score ranges and the same percentages that we allocate to them. It doesn't account for like adjusting those to say, okay, well, we actually only have $1.3 million. And so we actually need to make the score ranges smaller in, or, um, you know, actually get a little more granular with where we're giving it. That, that is exactly correct. Right, right. And yes, because I, I, yeah, we, 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 that can be part of future discussions, whether we want to tighten up our score ranges, you know, that yes, we can, we could potentially lower ceilings, you know, and, and, you know, when you, when you look at, when you look at historical funding, when you lower ceilings, the folks you impact are, are typically our larger agencies that have been applying for more funding for quite some time. So that's, that's also a possibility. Okay, the last one that I did. On this one, we, we have both floors and ceilings because what I did was I took their actual request. So if an agency requested less than the floor. And again, those are in your packet from February and I can, I can look, I can bring them back up if needed. But these are the floors that we created for our priority. I, didn't, I left the budget column in there, but it, uh, it's not being used for this. Just, I just left it. Um, if they applied less than the floor, I moved them up to the floor. Or if they applied above the ceiling, I moved them back to the ceiling, okay? So if they if they ask for less, I move them to floor. If they ask more than ceiling, I lowered their, their request. If their request was in the range of floor and ceiling, I left it alone. Okay, so it was the actual request and what they actually got. Okay. So if you go down, um, so for example, Wild Plum asked for a hundred thousand. But the education ceiling that we had is eighty thousand. 
So I lowered them down to 80,000. Um, in reality, they got, I think this year they were awarded 90,000 because their score put them at the 90% range, right? So they would lose funding if, if you know, uh, if they were to apply again, if we kept these ceilings and they applied, um, whereas right above it, the R Center, their actual request was 15,000. And so that is less than the floor. So I moved them up to the floor, <coughs> excuse me, which is 40,000. And they scored very well. And they would have received 100% of their request. Okay. So you can, we can scroll down. Um, there's a few changes here and there, but overall. So, for example, um, you know, safe shelter. Their ceiling is 100,000 and they asked for 100,000 and they got, and that's what they actually got was 90,000. Um, you know, whereas, and the same thing for Immigrant Legal Center, that was the floor. Um, well, no, that's not the floor, that's, that's the, that's in between floor and ceiling. So that's what they, they, they kept the same, whereas, we're suggested the floor is 10,000, they only apply for five, they would have gotten an increase to their funding. So those are just a few examples. Kimberly. Um, I just, I'm looking through this, it really seems like those high requests are the outliers. And so for, we're totally skewing the funding picture towards the outliers, I feel, on the upper end. When looking at the average of the actual requests, it's quite a bit lower. Um, so I'm wondering, how to factor that in so that it's not distorting the whole funding process. That's, that's an excellent point. And this, that's why we actually started this whole conversation is that we, Karen and I've noticed that we just have some outliers that um, you know, have been increasingly getting larger and larger portions. And so one way to do that is to say, and, and it might cause some pain, is to say, we're gonna just lower the ceilings for everyone. And so, you know, we're gonna try and, 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 and align. Um, that's one way of doing it. And, and I think I don't have an answer, other answers. I think this is why bringing it to the board and, and appreciate your thoughts and, and, and we deliberate together on how to, how to get there. And I'm sure Karen has any thoughts as well. But yes, that's that's definitely a reality and a challenge that we face. So on this one, we get closer. We overspent by 400,000 going this route, assuming that folks, you know, will ask for what they actually need and not, you know, rush this rush to the ceiling. Um, I don't know. I mean, there, there are some assumptions that we've made on, on these. And, and of course, to get this point, we haven't changed score ranges and percentages of what people get allocated. So that is my presentation, or that's those are the ones I created. I can go back and create more. I can look at lowering ceilings I, or other ideas that the board may have. Um. The first thing that comes to mind is that like in some in some ways we set these ceilings before we ever get um, like the requests, um, which you know we've talked about wanting to to be clear with folks, but also have it not be a black box. But I also wonder if like you know something that's a little more flexible based on like what the needs are that are being expressed um, might. I, I, I don't really know. I think, you know, when we've, obviously we've got some outliers, we have a lot of organizations that have fairly large budgets. Um, to me, that like points to the fact that like either small organization, like the, the issue may not be actually our process so much as like smaller organization or our funding allocation, but it may be that smaller organizations just don't have the time, the money, the resources to be applying for it. Um, or they've been told no in the past because they haven't had high enough scores. And so it's, it, then it's not worth it or that sort of thing. Um, 
and and maybe it's less about it being a black box <laughs> i don't know um but i am curious what other folks think or if there's other um stacy one of one of my take homes from this also is i mean obviously we have to we can't go over but I, i'm assuming we cannot go over budget that's my that we have a budget and it's not okay to say oh well sorry we gave away too much um and another thing that i was also noticing is uh so what i remember from was it, i can't remember if it was january february when we it must have been january when we talked about this maybe um one of the reasons we um we were doing this in addition to the outliers was because we said that we felt like the smaller organizations were underfunded um i don't think we have that many smaller organizations so i i think that that's objective is maybe not really appropriate here. I mean, there's so many over a million. I mean, if we're calling a $250,000 budget, a smaller organization, you know, that's it. Yes, it's smaller than a million, but a million is smaller than 5 million. And so I'm, I'm not, I, I don't think that was exactly what we were talking about when we meant smaller organization. Then the other piece of that also is I'm looking at our scores and it's obvious that these big organizations like the YMCA and our center have grant writers that know how to write these to meet, write their proposals to meet our goals and they're getting more money because they're not, their scores are higher. So if you truly, I feel like if you, exactly like you were just saying, Caitlin, if you have a smaller organization that doesn't have the same staff, that has a volunteer that's writing this without experience and you know is doing it because she's the feet on the street and she knows most about it, she's not gonna be able to compete with the Our Center or other major um, organizations like this. So I do think that that is also, uh, that that's something I'm seeing from the numbers that I, I'm, I don't know. I, I don't know for sure, obviously, but it, the numbers seem to point in that direction. Eliberto? I just, I just got a thought. Uh, and I'm just gonna throw it out there. Um, so I, I sit on the board of the Longmont Community Foundation. I have sat on the board of the Boulder Community Foundation. And I'm wondering, to this point that we're having this conversation, I'm wondering if, you know, they have a lot more flexibility with their funding than we do. They're a, they're a private foundation, they're a community foundation, not private foundation, they're a community foundation. But their, their funding is a lot more flexible than ours. And so to Stacy's point that we don't have a lot of smaller, and by smaller, I mean under, I think there's only one, I'm trying to see here. There was only, two agencies under $250,000. And one of them didn't get funded because of scores. Right. Right. And the other one only asked for two, what did they ask for? $2,500. So I guess, I guess the question for us or for you all to consider is, is it appropriate or is it in the purview of this advisory board to be thinking about funding the smaller organ? I mean, are, are we looking at funding startup or small organizations, or are we to focus on those organizations that have the capacity to deliver the services that, that Longmont residents need? I guess that's the question. I think that's a really good. Um, I had pulled just to, to add a little bit of um, context as well. I pulled up um, the like, PDF RFP that um, Boulder shared last year, City of Boulder for theirs. Um, and they had a, a minimum request amount of $10,000. Um, but they also specifically uh, said that at least 8,000 of that 10,000 needed to be um, for the program itself and not just funding staff. So, um, a maximum, and I don't know if the percentage, I don't know, I was trying to see if they actually have, um, if it's a, yeah, so at least 8,000 in eligible program expenses um, 
including program specific staff pay and benefits um, and basically things to carry out that that specific program, but not they're not interested in funding like an organization as a whole, it needed to be something that actually addresses the needs. Um, so just for context, that's what City of Boulder did last year. Um, I don't see a maximum listed in theirs, but. Um, right, and they, I've seen their contracts and we work together and we don't, Longmont doesn't do this, but they actually make the agencies write, when they do their contracts, they make, they make the agencies list the percentage of their funding going to staff. Um, I, I, we don't do that, but but they do. I, I've seen those contracts. Uh, Kim, that's so interesting. How do they um, have accountability in that process? Are they actually checking to see if that is being funded as a, as as stated, or is it just kind of a a paper exercise? <laughs> I don't know. I mean, we get we get fine, we get year end reports and year end financials. Do they dig into them? I, I, I mean, they have more staff. Mm -hmm. I will tell you that I don't. Uh, right. much, I mean, I, I look at them, but there's always so much going on. That's a lot of work to follow up on it's that. Lot, I, yeah, I, I've gotten most of all of the, and I still haven't put together all. I'm still working on trying to get all the year end reports, and there's a lot of data mm -hmm. to dig into. Uh, Stacy. Uh, so um, to, to that last kind, Kimberly, I would also wonder if if mandating that it not go to staff payroll is is that really our objective? Because some of these organizations, uh, especially the smaller ones, again, if we're trying to target them, that's that's what they have is feet on the street. Um, you know, they're not they're not putting big dollars into necess necessarily into programs. They they might just be doing casework. So that might just be something to think about too that might bias um, something like that against the smaller organizations that we're trying to serve. Yeah, um, I one thing I liked about it is, um, I think we talked about this with some of the applications last year is that like, they were applying for a program. So I'll give the example of Salude um, who um, has applied, you know, they, they get funding um, and often they're like, okay, we want to fund this, um, this program for, you know, increasing access to, I, I think one of them was like trying to get more folks in for like dental care um, or something like that, or doing like, I, or they did a mental health evaluation, but then the staffing that they did was basically paying for uh, essentially medical assistance that would just be in every single appointment. Um, so, you know, that was sort of a like, yes, and this is like this much of your, like this much of what the medical assistant is doing. Like we're, we're functionally, you're, you're, you're talking about something that we care about, which is mental health, but is what we're funding actually like contributing to that longer, um, that longer term or that bigger picture of actually addressing major mental health um, issues within our community. Maybe not because what, what, what you're really doing is supplementing your staff and being able to hire a few more medical assistants, um, you know, but putting it under a program name that, you know, matches what we're looking for. Um, so I think that was one of the ones that, that example, but that's not the only one, you know, there may be others, I, but flip side is that like EFA, their entire, you know, all of their service really is like a program that supports some of our, our goals. And so like general staff for them, caseworkers for that, there's a lot more connected, right, than, um, than that. And so we, we may have to get a little more granular in our like scoring and evaluation of that. Um, and that's less of like putting the parameters around it and more about us being, you know, kind of discerning that from their applications. Uh, Councilwoman Yarbrough, hello. Um, I'm listening to you all and bring up some really, really, really good points. I think we need to be careful about the staff. Um, 
only because without staff, you can't perform those programs. And when you don't have the programs, you can't provide service. So, um, so you know, I just think that an organization know where they need that support. Um, I don't know if we really want to micromanage everything within those applications in those organizations. I think that's a lot of work. Um, I think we just need to, what are the outcomes? What are we looking for, right? And how can we measure it? And that's it, I think. I mean, everything that you all are saying is good, I guess, because I work for a nonprofit. And I know that if I don't have help, um, I can't, I can't perform, I, I'm not effective with my programs. So, um, so that mean if I need an assistant to help me within my programs, then that's what I need in order to, for me to perform and be effective within my programs. So I just think we need to be very mindful of the organizations know what they need, their needs are. And so, and it's up to us to look at the past. Of course, we know the last couple of years, the situations have been totally different. Um, but what was it in 2019? What were their outcome? Well, how did they measure their success of the programs or whatever? Uh, although the programs have probably, uh, you know, have changed quite a bit, but just look at, you know, making sure they're moving toward the goals that we're asking them to and what they're doing. Um, that's all. I just think that we got to be very careful with what we keep asking for and what we keep changing. And I think that we'll be pulling weeds all day long, trying to get rid of the weeds. And guess what? As soon as you pull that one up, something else going to come up. So just be very mindful. That's all. Um, Karen Phillips and then Ellie Berto. Yeah, I mean, when they apply for this money, they specifically say what they want the money for. I mean, that's what we're and maybe I'm not understanding something here, but there should be no issue about, you know, we give them money because they requested it for like a certain program or for a certain thing. So I'm kind of confused what you're all talking about with staff because, you know, if that's what they ask, they need another, you know, they need another employee, then they'll ask for that money. And that's well, what we're providing. So, I mean, I'm kind of don't understand so, here. So like what I was saying is like city of Boulder says that like they won't fund general staff. They'll only fund it if it's actually related to the program. And one of the things we did last year was actually evaluate whether the programs were delivering against like the human needs assess like the program area. So like, for example, we had, um, there was somebody who applied like two years ago where like overall they provided like healthcare or something like that to a population, but they were addressing something like, I think it was salute, addressing obesity in kids, which was not at all like anywhere in the human needs assessment as something that needed to be addressed in the community. Um, and so that program didn't really fit with what we wanted to fund um, at all. And so the, the question of, um, you know, making, you know, just because they tell us they need it doesn't necessarily mean we should fund it. Um, and so that's part of our evaluation is making sure that like, they actually are providing a program or something that is meeting the specific needs of the community. So do we get like a receipt from them saying, you know, you gave us this money, this is what we use it for? Do we ask them for that kind of thing? That's part of the contracting process. Right, they, they, they don't provide a financial report at the end of the year. And I, I haven't, I, I, we made them um, do February 11th because we were all behind and I have not actually gone through them all. Okay. So, but yes, we do ask for a financial update and a financial report and, and most of them, you know, all of them do give it to us. Sometimes got, I just gotta pull it out of them. Okay, thank you. I don't have to do that, but sometimes I do. So um, I'm about to throw out this idea again. I did it a couple months ago, is to Shakita's point, and it is a little bit, there is a there is some challenge that we may we may be accused of micromanagement, but we to Shakita's point about outcomes, we could say, here's the outcomes we want, put an RFP out there like Boulder does and say, who can get those outcomes for us? But that means that we'd have to think about what our outcomes are in our priority areas. So that's just a thought that I've shared a couple of times. Uh, we don't have to go there, but 
Uh, that's that's something to think about. Uh, Graham. Uh, thanks, Eliberto, for putting those together. I appreciate that. I had really hoped it would bring a lot of clarity, and I'm, so, I'm sorry to say it did not for me anyway. <laughs> um, but if I recall, the main problem was was we kept running into unallocated funds at the end of the year, right? And that uh, we were also a little concerned that we we weren't able to fully fund high priority areas because of some of the ways some of the rules we had inserted. And so we thought, oh, well, if we think of a different way, um, we can maybe distribute the funds better, but it sounds like these other ways, whether budget size or, or um, you know, uh, set, set ceiling for priorities, they, um, they're, not, they're not quite doing it, they're overspending. So, uh, you know, I think my, my A choice here would be to leave the formula as is and then deal with, have an extra at the end of the year and go through an RFP process or, or allocate based on the priorities of the year or B, uh, uh, add the budget size qualifier like Mile High United Way. I think that was that was who that was modeled off of, if I remember. So anyway, that's my input. Karen Roney. Yeah, so I think, um, I think the problem we were trying to solve is, uh, um, is, is, is certainly what Graham talked about, you know, number, number one was that uh, because we uh, ended up having, you know, more money to allocate than we had anticipated, our current formula made it hard to allocate everything. And, and, and obviously we had 100K that was still in, in the hopper. I think the other thing, you know, that we, at least initially, we, we, tried to address was, um, was, you know, setting some expectations about what, um, you know, kind of address the ceiling issue. So with new agencies coming in and they, you know, they could apply for $150,000 and our, our formula would end up that they would get a, a, a large portion possibly of, of what they had requested. And it, it, it just was some disparity in terms of, of how much entities were asking for. So part of what we were trying to attempt to, to look at is if we set some expectations up front about here's, you know, here's the ceiling, you know, here's the floor, whatever, this is the range of funding that you could expect. Um, so that's, you know, that's what we were trying to to um, examine, so so we didn't necessarily hit the mark. And we also, as I think, as uh, Eliberto mentioned, is that we also didn't adjust anything with the the formula. So I mean, there's more there's more adjustments that we could make. I think what we just wanted to try to do is if we set some expectations uh, in terms of what agencies the amount that they apply for. Um, where where might that take us? Um, so it sounds like we're still working it. I wonder. <laughs> I wonder to that point if um, you know one of the things um, we we could do is um, you know we've set we've sort of internally set a ceiling based on like fifty percent of the total amount. We've said like no one agency can get more than that. Um, we've also talked about that around particularly like affordable housing and some of the things that like that obviously does cut off some of our you know some of the organizations that are delivering some of the most impactful work in those areas. Um, you know I we had a handful that just like hit that ceiling because they requested more and they had no idea that we set that ceiling. And so, um, you know, whereas if we had said that and they had thought about it, they may have broken it down into, we have actually three different programs that fall within this and they're all, you know, smaller things, but addressing more specific. Um, I wonder if even just saying like, hey, we ended up <clears throat> getting $1.5 million with a rough breakdown of like 20% to housing stability. You know, even if we gave just like rough idea of the totals to give folks an idea of, you know, what, where we wanna spend that money. Um, we have ha historically had a lot more on the skill building and a lot less on affordable housing. 
Um, but if we told people, hey, 25% of this funding is affordable housing things, that might change how people are thinking about it. Um, even if we're not telling them you specifically would be limited. I have no idea if that like addresses kind of what we were, I mean, like, but it maybe encourages folks to apply for more if they're hitting some of those priority areas and understanding like, actually this is our top priority is affordable housing, but we also wanna fund these other things. Eliberto. Actually, I think that's a great idea. Um, I, I think part of the challenge is that we don't know what the final number is for the budget until way after we've launched the, um, that being said, I don't see why we couldn't say historically, or we couldn't say, you know, in 2022, we had 1.25 million and this is how we wanted to spend it. Um, and we, 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 the board had decided to, if, if, we, if we do decide later on this year that we have the correct priorities and we have the, the right percentages, why couldn't we do that? We could put it in to say, hey, we spent 1.285 million. This is how we want to spend this fund. We want 25% to go to house to, you know, activities that promote uh, affordable housing or that maintain people housed. We want to spend 20% on education and, and let them do the math. I mean, we, that might be a good, it, it might still have us overspending, but, you know, we, we you know, that's, that's even with just the priorities, it's putting budget, putting the budget priorities out there. You know, even if they knew that, you, that you know, only 50%, I guarantee you that everybody would go over 50% potentially. So that's something to think about. Yeah. And it at least conveys what those priorities are, right? Like we we've we've listed out listed them out, but we haven't ever really been specific about like you know, housing is you know one of the biggest um, and that sort of thing. Um, and maybe maybe to to Graham's point of like wanting to we we underspent last year. We were trying to you know figure out the right balance to make sure that you know folks were asking for things that actually supported the programs. Well, let's be clear about what we want to support. And, and maybe that is actually sufficient to, to help drive in that direction. Without, and, and I think maybe to, maybe Kim or Deanna, I can't remember which, but without getting too complex with like, here's a limit based on your budget or here's a limit based on your priority area. Like maybe that's just getting too complicated. Um, to, to really be effective. Stacy. What, what I do like about that idea is um, you, every year then without reinventing this wheel, you meet your budget because you're sending percentages. And, um, and then, and, and we're not administrating, we're not over administrating. So um, it, it, keeps, it keeps the formula simple. Um, it incents people to do projects in areas that that we deem that the city needs. And um, yeah, I mean, I, I like it. Deanna? Yes, I'm just wondering, um, for Eliberto and Karen, do you feel like that sort of compromise is sufficient to address some of the concerns that we were trying to address? Um, I mean, I think one of the concerns, unless I'm misunderstanding, is that we have these a few outlier agencies that are just asking for more and more and more money. And I'm not sure that setting that information about historical budgets and, and priority areas necessarily addresses our concern of maybe reining in those outliers. Um, but I, I'm also, I mean, as as Graham said, I, I was hoping that those examples would really illuminate this, and it definitely illuminated that just doing those new scenarios is going to cause a big problem for us in terms of budget. So, I don't know if you think that it's sufficient to to do a historical analysis, or if we need to think about some sort of compromise to try and rein in those um, outliers. You, you know, I, I think that we can. 
Um, I think we can look at other, you know, other scenarios. I think we can look at some of the, we can look at the formulas, you know, you know, and we also, I mean, we had talked about this, um, Eliberto and I did, is that, is that, and, and this was an option we looked at a, a, a few years ago. I don't know whether any of the board members, I don't think any of the board mem current board members are part of that process, but we, we just kind of said at some point in time, you know, we, we go down to X and then the, the money is spent in that particular bucket and we, you know, cut it off. And then we go to the, you know, to the next bucket. And again, the higher scoring agencies get um, get funded, in, you know, so there's more entities, more agencies that get no funding, um, but that was painful. So, so we, we really never, you know, examined that. So I think we do need to look at some expectation about, um, you know, what's, what's what's the amount really to um you know to apply for or not to apply over x x amount just so we have a we just level that and we set some expectations about this is what this is what you can and expect we we also talked about then do we might we add back you know based on you know performance or or high scoring um agencies this isn't easy so yeah and i know it didn't um it was it was the good suggestion to okay apply these ideas apply these um, scenarios to what happened last year and and we we see where it got us so I just think we need to continue to work it a little bit more maybe work it in terms of the formulas um, but come up with some expectation about you know what to apply for or at least a ceiling around that. I mean, to that point, we could, I mean, I, I wonder if even just disclosing that in the past we've set, you know, a maximum that any, any program or agency can receive is 50% of the total funding for the, for the particular focus area. Um, it doesn't necessarily give folks a dollar amount, but it at least sets the expectation that we are going to put a ceiling on it and you know i i don't know if that's sufficient to you know and to say like okay in you know 2022's funding round it was you know a max of one hundred and ten thousand dollars in housing stability or you know, whatever it was um you know because we won't get the the budget amounts until later we don't we may not want to put that but maybe we just give that expectation of like that's the most you could expect because and i think fundamentally that's because we don't want to have a single agency delivering one of our focus goals um you know that we don't want to put all of our eggs into one basket so to speak for any one of those um, priority areas Deanna, I see you re-raised. So I guess I was just going to follow up on that and say that if we're thinking about either transmitting that information directly about this is our floor and our ceiling with specific numbers or saying historically, here's the information on, on what the floor and ceiling were and letting them sort of figure out those numbers themselves, we probably still need to figure out how to adjust this so that we're not blowing our budget wide open, right? So then is it appropriate to ask staff to do a little more work in terms of how we adjust the percentage formulas? I can't think of any other way to bring the budget back down without adjusting the percentage formulas unless we change the caps. And I guess I would have to think about how that impacts all of these organizations historically, what they've asked for. But I mean, maybe staff could explore how we how it gets impacted by changing the percentage formulas or something so that we can move this forward to get where we want to go. So one of the, just to add on that, one of the things that I've seen done not in a like nonprofit one, but was basically once applications are received and scored, before you actually see what the scores are across them, you see sort of like what the median and what the, the spread of them is and determine what the the funding is based on 
essentially, essentially instead of being like, okay, we have a six point spread or a 13 point spread or whatever, you kind of adjust it so that, um, you know, how would you, how would you actually allocate those percentages such that, um, you know, you're, you're essentially funding everything above the median at, at the, at the least. Um, so there's some different ways to do that. Once you get the information in, we just don't know, like beforehand, like how well are agencies going to score and how much are they going to ask for? Like, that's not something we can predict. And so sometimes setting the formula before we know that information feels like it's sort of putting it ahead of like actually getting the data of what people request. Kim? I really feel like we need a math major <laughs> to, to figure this out. And I'm trying to think about ranking and, and figuring out a pot of money for each area and then ranking all of the requests for that specific area and then creating that equation so that it's it's set like you're you know you're going to hit that dollar amount and you've ranked it just within within that that subject matter so it's it's very defined um, but I think that equation is is what I need help figuring out <laughs> but I don't know if that makes sense like it's a ranking system specific to the topic rather than um, scoring it and random scores. Um, but actually looking at who's most deserving in that specific area. Eliberto. So Kim, I have a follow-up question because as soon as you said that, my, my brain started thinking, well, does that mean, so if we had 500 grand for, you know, I'm just saying, just throwing out a number, 500 grand for, for housing, right? And we had, because we typically don't have tons of applicants for it. Let's say we had five, right? The way I heard you, and again, so correct, this is what I'm, I'm saying, correct me if I'm wrong. The way I heard you is that we would rank it, you know, um, based on what, what, how, whatever criteria that we're gonna set for it. And then we would fund according to rank. So we wouldn't care, or it wouldn't matter what they asked for, it would be, we have 500 grand, we want to spend it on housing. This is how we ranked your, your application. We've divided it based on that rank. This is what you're getting. So EFA, who always asks for 16,000, even though I've told them that there's no limit on what they can ask for, um, you know, they, they could score super high and get 150,000, right? Is, is, is that the way you're thinking of it or is there a diff or, or am I missing something? Yeah, I guess, I mean, that's, that's kind of the scary part is because you don't know what the demand will be and it could be a huge amount of money that's going to fewer agencies. But if we truly are prioritizing certain areas and wanting to fund accordingly, it seems like that's, that makes the most sense. Um, but I can see a lot of potential problems, but just looking at it big picture, that would be, you know, funding to our priority system um, and making people compete with others within that, that system instead of across the board. Karen Roney. So I'm just checking in. Have we expended most of our brain cells? Or are there any other ideas? Because um, it sounds like we need to we need to continue to work it. There have been some suggestions for us to explore. And um, so we can continue on. It's really quite fine, but I just wanted to check in and see if uh, there's any other great idea that um, that we should go back and 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 flesh out? I don't think so. I think we I think we need to continue the discussion. There's a lot of ideas here. Maybe folks can marinate on it a bit. And yeah, um, we appreciate that. Yeah, yeah. Um, okay. Uh, next item is site visits. Um, 
we'll start with together. And I think, uh, Robert, was that your, did you do that one? Okay. For Eliberto, do you, did you have anything you wanted to share from the desk audit on that? Uh, yeah, so I think it ended, up, it ended up being just me, which is, which is fine. That, that's happened in the past. Um, and um, no, I, I didn't have a lot to talk. The desk audit was, was pretty good. You know, usually what people, what people tend to forget is their grievance process. And what I found interesting is a couple of things. They have a grievance pro process for each of their programs and they send it to me afterwards. Right, so the, the source has a grievance process, their outreach has a different grievance process, which I thought was, was interesting. That is not one, one single grievance process. Um, so, um, but you know, so for those who don't know, Together, I'll talk a little bit about it. Um, so Together is a homeless service provider that primarily focuses on youth um, youth that are experiencing homelessness. We talk a lot about, you know, the challenges that they face. Typically, a lot of a lot of kids that are aging out of foster care struggle. We talk a lot about the kind of services they provide. You know, just a, a place to connect. A lot of a lot of life skill type case management. Um, we also talked about. I also have because I work a lot with them. We talked about their elder program as well, and you know the work that, that's happening there in street outreach here in Longmont, uh, where they are working diligently to connect people to uh, both youth and um, non-youth to our coordinated entry system. Um, you know, I, on the other side, I also have their year-end report. And I also can tell you that they didn't serve as many folks as they thought they were going to serve. And a lot of that was because they had to shut down the source, which is their drop-in center. Sorry, I should have, I should have given you that detail. Uh, the source is their drop-in center from, from Boulder that, that youth can, uh, can access, Longmont youth can access. Um, and they, you know, they, had, they had intended to serve, I think, 15 or 20. And I think they only served seven uh, youth from Longmont in 2021. And a lot of that happened to be because they had to shut down a bunch of times. And so people couldn't access the source. Um, but overall, I felt that they, you know, they, 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 of course, they're a over a million dollar budget agency. They got their act together as far as having all their, their, their documents, their documentation, their personnel policies, all of that is uh, good. And, and they really built, built in their, their, what they call Jedi. And I think that that is justice, equity, diversion, and, and inclusion, and they and they and they have really weaved that in into their into their personnel policies, into their board manual. Um, they've been doing a lot of work on that. And if I remember right, I think they had twenty percent of their board was people of color. Um, so, which is is you know we we'd love to have more, of course, but that's a good start. Um, so yeah, that was my, uh, if anybody had any questions about Together, I'd be happy to answer, but uh, I felt that they are a strong agency that are doing good work um, and have really committed to uh, their equity work and, and, and they're trying to uh, make sure that it is, it is embedded in all of their foundational documents, so. Awesome. And and they were formerly known as attention homes. Is that correct? Okay. okay. Yeah, apparently, yeah. I talked to Eric Ozempa. I mean, they they apparently started here in Longmont, Karen. They had or they had a house here in Longmont a long time ago. Maybe even before yeah, they have because they have a I was talking to Eric Ozempa, they have a um um endowment with the Longmont Community Foundation. Oh. Yeah, long time ago. So interesting. They have some local routes too, not just Boulder, but you're long one. Awesome. Thanks, Eliberto. Um, and then the second one that we had was for um, Boulder County AIDS Project, DCAP, right? Um, 
Alberto, do you want to talk about the desk audit and then I can talk about um, our, our meeting and discussion with them? Yeah, uh, uh, again, another superb agency with a lot of great staff that have their act together uh, when it comes to, and part of, so part of, and the like, same thing with Salud and a few others, when, you know, when they get federal funding, there's just a lot of requirements. So they, t they tend to, those, those agencies that get, off, they get federal funding tend to have all of the required documents that we ask for and, and more because the feds just put so many regulations on them. So they, they tend to, I usually never have any issues with agencies that receive federal funding, just be having their documentation, their, all of their policies and, and stuff, because it's not just us, it's, it's what the Fed requires. So, so yeah, I, I didn't find anything in the desk audit. Awesome. Um, I think the one of the biggest takeaways I had was that, um, you know, with the pandemic in particular, they had to adjust um, a lot of their service model um, to do things more um, remotely. And in many cases that resulted in, um, you know, less delivery of service um, because a lot of a lot of the success for BCAP really relies on relationship building. Um, so they they do work with other agencies. They have um, you know they do street outreach um, in particular um, as well as case management. And so one of the stories they shared that I thought was particularly interesting was that um, you know they have um, they do things like um, they they try to address like harm reduction um, as well as getting folks into you know supportive housing or things like that. And so, but often it starts with that relationship. And so, you know, being able to come in and talk to someone, um, you know, to, to seek out, for example, like clean needles um, or like disposing of them and to have someone who is like not judgmental about that is the opening, it's the opening dance of the, the services they provide. Um, and they can, you know, They've had folks who have, you know, started at that and built a relationship with um, someone in the program, and then eventually, you know, gotten on to, you know, gotten testing and gotten someone else to get testing. But like, they didn't come in looking for testing, and they weren't going to do it. Like that was not at all. And so, you know, while that is part of the primary, you know, sort of where outcomes happen, that is not where sort of like the intake um, happens. And so um, I think the other thing is BCAP works really, it, it seems like they work really collaboratively with a lot of other organizations. So they, they team up, um, I think with some of their street outreach for with um, you know, folks who are addressing unhoused issues um, and, and that sort of thing. And so it's not, they're trying to address it holistically because you know, somebody, even if they can get access to antivirals and retrovirals um, and, you know, stay up to date with that. It doesn't really make a whole lot of difference if that person is on the street and can't afford, you know, housing. Um, so, um, yeah, it's super, um, it seems like, you know, just really well-established organization that seems really tapped into what um, the needs of the community they serve is. Um, and recognizing that like, they can't just address, like they're not there just to address, you know, basically folks living with HIV and AIDS. Like they, there's, they also um, work with folks who have um, hepatitis C um, and other, um, and so, but they recognize that like, there's this whole continuum of care and they don't necessarily provide that, but they help get folks connected to the other organizations in the community um, and sort of, I'd say, they're kind of like the ideal, <laughs> one of the ideals in terms of how well um, they they coordinate across that and try to try to address those without like taking it all on themselves. So. Any any questions or anything uh, from other folks on the board? All right, the last item on our agenda is announcements and other business. Do we have any announcements or other business? 
seeing uh, Ellie Berto. I saw you come off mute and Karen. Karen has an announcement. Okay. <laughs> well, I just want to, you know, this is my last meeting. Um, I retire, I'm retiring at the end of March. So, um, so I just wanted to wish you and Eliberto luck in figuring out this formula thing. <laughs> She's like, peace out, not my problem anymore. <laughs> <laughs> so anyhow, so I just wanted to um, wish you all well. Thank you for the opportunity to, um, you know, to support the incredible work that you do in, in the community to, you know, really be, um, really be mindful about how to best invest these, these dollars in um and helping folks in our in our community so um so i just wanted to say goodbye and um wish you well you will still have eliberto and molly they will still be here and um carrying things forward so thanks for your service you're you're welcome what are you gonna do um you know i'm gonna figure that out i'm gonna take a little i'm gonna take a break <laughs> So, I, I've been here for 32 years. Wow. And so, um, so I think for, for a while, I'm just going to, you know, not do a lot of anything and then, and then I'll figure it out. You'll love it. You'll love it. Yeah. <laughs> you know, and Kathy Fedler has come back to work for the city. So she's working part-time. She started last week. So hopefully, um, because it is, we're having a hard time hiring um, staff. So, mm -hmm. so yeah, she's coming back to help out. Uh, Deanna? So I, I was hoping that this subject would just never come up and that maybe <laughs> the rumors of your retirement would just be forever delayed. But I really just wanna thank you, Karen, for being so fabulous and guiding all of us volunteers on this board and, um, just really appreciate and recognize how valuable your service has been to the community and to all of us. And what a big hole you're going to be leaving here, formula or not. It's, it's, <laughs> it's across the board for sure. We will miss you more than words can say and value everything that you have done for all of us and for the city very, very thank much. So thank you thank so you much, very much for, all for of those your work. kind words. Thank you very much. Well, you deserve more than those kind words, but I don't think of any more. So that's what you get. <laughs> I appreciate that. Karen, uh, any other announcements or other business? All right, seeing none, I will entertain a motion to adjourn. All right, Karen Phillips is moving for us to adjourn. Do we have a second? Kim, all right, see you all in about a month. Bye -bye. Not all of us. Bye, Karen. <laughs> Bye.